There has been so much that has happened in just the last week that you may have missed something. As with every morning show, you can find the links to everything you're going to see here below this video. We're starting with the space weather and human health aspect. The statistical correlations between space weather events and negative health outcomes are hard to ignore, but when we get direct ionospheric correlations, we begin to understand the mechanism by which this space energy has driven the correlations found in the peer-reviewed literature. HR 4796, probably the most well-studied, most photographed, and best understood dust ring in the visible cosmos. Except as a testament to the expanse of cosmic mystery, none of that study allowed us to discover the massive dust belt vastly stretching around the entire system, at least not until recently. This is critical because we believe that the plasma and dust population in the vicinity of the hypothesized dark matter halos could explain much of the activity seen without the magic material, but that's presuming we can discover it. Up next, a recognition of what solar scientists have said falling on mostly deaf ears for years. The jet stream is a long-range projector of the weather in the UK, and the broader story tied together here is that the jet stream, polar vortex, and North Atlantic oscillation almost completely control the UK climate and all are predictable years in advance based on solar activity, all pointing towards a disruption of the temperate weather in the North Atlantic this century. Next, we have Professor Egdal doing his Alphan impression and definitively finding the same types of problems with frozen in field lines and the explosive energy of disrupting currents. This should rewrite a fair portion of space weather and cosmic science, provided anyone is listening. By far the most critical cosmology paper this week was the discovery that the Centaurus A dwarf satellite galaxies debunk dark matter theories in their orbital patterns. This makes the three most studied of such galaxies Centaurus, Andromeda, and our own Milky Way, all sharing these patterns that do not fit the standard dark matter models. By far the biggest story overall this week in our world was the launch of China and Italy's electromagnetic earthquake forecasting satellite. We'll have much more on this in just a moment, but first, if you aren't following us on Facebook, you'll miss a lot of quick little shares, but this week we had a blowout of shared eclipse photos on our own. Looks like you guys had a great time, just like I did. Website members at suspiciousobservers.org, we are up to 16 Deeper Look episodes on the year. Lots of interesting material, but number 15, it's about Earth's equatorial ion fountain. Not only explains the ionospheric excitation double pattern under the day side, but indicates how young observer Ferris Wald won the New Mexico and then National Science Championships tracking solar effects on weather. He'll be at the conference again this year, and I can tell you that number 15 is well worth the few minutes. We also have our weekly podcast, Fly on the Wall, found on the premium page, and without your support, we don't get to do any of this. Now, I promised a little bit more on the earthquake forecasting satellite. Here is a rerun of the special video we did on the topic February 2nd. Enjoy. If you didn't hear the big news, China has launched my dream machine, at least 90% of it. As veteran observers know, we have an odd tangential connection to this project, and so let's take a look at what's happening in that project with some history. It actually goes all the way back to the Demeter satellite, a French satellite that operated last decade and which was used to document numerous electromagnetic pre-seismic anomalies to major earthquakes. Despite the flood of papers that used its data, it was never used to forewarn to deliver information about those signals before the actual earthquakes. It was decommissioned, and since then we've awaited another machine to do what it did, but in a way that would be useful to everyone. Well, the new machine has some upgrades to be sure, including an electric field detector, which was one of the two things, along with an ultraviolet imager, which is not on the satellite, that I believed would indicate when the solar polar fields were acting strongly on Earth's magnetic system and could cause the major earthquakes. That was indeed the subject of a paper written in 2015. My co-authors Dr. Uyen and Dr. Holloman helped confirm the correlation statistically between the solar polar fields and earthquakes and then described the mechanism. One of the first people to ever read and review the final paper is actually a member of this project and is likely to be exceptionally knowledgeable about concepts related to electroquakes. Good sign for them. The reason he was probably selected for the review was this project indeed, which he actually started to be a part of while we were first discovering that some of the electromagnetic pre-seismic anomalies might be a connection to space weather beyond just the lithosphere-atmosphere-ionosphere connection. He was already in the planning process for this satellite, and now 
Today is the day it finally launches. The mission is supposed to be only five years and will only survey China and nearby Southeast Asia and probably Europe as well since an Italian group is heavily involved, but it will be turning off most of those devices for the most part around other areas of the world. It will include at least a few years of study protocols and data gathering before considering any active alert and even so, it could be possible that the locations will be restricted and might even be considered China's private information. Wouldn't be the first time. However, this absolutely puts this China and Italy team in the major race to be the kings of electromagnetic earthquake forecasting. For those just joining the program and don't know about some of the other notable groups in that electroquake category, one of them is the NASA and ETH Zurich team, which came out with their model results and plans to go forward in November of last year. At the end of the day, they actually came to include the two atmospheric parameters that we use in our model, outgoing long-wave radiation and the geoelectric system of Earth, although we like to use the global electric circuit as indicated by wind and pressure. For more on our model, including the background from 2015, you can go to quakewatch.net and look up at the top right. Our current model is found in the 2017 and 2018 spots just below that. While we don't have the clout of those other major groups, we didn't have the hurdles of academia, government, and policy, and we are indeed already more than a year into successful real-world forecasting. You can learn about that there, too. However, there is no question that today... It is the Chinese and Italian teams that stand in the spotlight. It's their day, and given their 100% electromagnetic focus, I can only predict at least some measure of success for them. And I can honestly say, I hope for that success to bolster the awareness and acceptance of electromagnetic pre-seismic anomalies as a means of realistically forecasting earthquakes. Be safe, everyone.